Organic chemistry is hard. Sometimes you have to memorize like a hundred mechanisms and keeping track of it all just seems impossible. Every reaction you've learned, every arrow you've drawn, is all part of a much bigger story. Electrons moving with a purpose. In this video, we're going to step back and take a look at the bigger picture. One unified map of all of Organic Chemistry 1. And make sure you stick around because I'll be sharing some helpful hints that should hopefully boost your confidence and your exam scores. Let's start with the classic SN2 mechanism. This is a one-step, concerted substitution mechanism. It's bimolecular, meaning that the rate depends on both substrate and nucleophile. It all begins with the nucleophile attacking the electrophilic carbon from the backside, and simultaneously the leaving group departs. The transition state shows partial bonds to both the nucleophile and leaving group, resulting in an inversion of the stereochemical configuration. Typically, this reaction is favored by strong nucleophiles and polar aprotic solvents. Every mechanism shares a secret, a move that happens again and again. And I'll show you what it is, but first, watch closely and see if you can figure it out. Next up is the SN1 mechanism. This is a two-step, unimolecular substitution mechanism proceeding via carbocation formation. In the first step of the mechanism, the leaving group departs, forming a carbocation intermediate. Next, the nucleophile can attack the carbocation to form the product. Some key points are that the rate is equal to the rate constant K times the concentration of our starting material. This reaction is favored by tertiary substrates because they form more stable carbocations. What's more, the product can be racemic due to planar carbocation intermediates. Did you catch it? A key to understanding a lot of the mechanisms in Organic Chemistry 1 is to understand carbocation stability. Tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, and secondary carbocations are more stable than primary carbocations. And the reason has to do with what's known as hyperconjugation. Remember that when you have a carbocation, there is an electron vacancy. Specifically, what that means is that there is an empty p orbital that doesn't have any electrons on this carbon, and therefore it is empty and can receive electron density. That's why nucleophiles actually attack carbocations. Important however, when you have a more substituted carbon, like in this tertiary carbocation example, there are neighboring groups that can contribute electron density. So consider the fact that in between each of these carbon to hydrogen bonds, there are a sigma bond that contains two electrons. And in each of these instances, these electrons can be used to donate into this empty p orbital. And when doing so, this is actually going to stabilize this carbocation intermediate. And the more substituents that are attached to that carbocation carbon, there is more opportunities to donate electron density into this empty orbital. And that's what's known as hyperconjugation. Now see if you can spot the next trend. Now let's talk about the SN1 reaction of alcohols. In this reaction, acid-catalyzed conversion of alcohols to alkyl halides occurs through a carbocation intermediate. The mechanism begins with protonation of the hydroxyl group to make it a better leaving group, aka water. Water can just leave as a leaving group, generating a carbocation. Next, the nucleophile attacks the carbocation. Some key points are that these reactions typically are fastest for tertiary and secondary alcohols because primary carbocations are rarely formed. Next, let's talk about SN1 mechanisms that have carbocation rearrangement. First, the leaving group departs, resulting in carbocation formation. From here, a hydride or alkyl shift produces a more stable carbocation. And finally, the nucleophile attacks the rearranged carbocation. Some key points are that rearrangements explain unexpected product positions. And typically, these only occur if the new carbocation is more stable. So for example, tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations. Next, let's talk about the SN2 reaction of primary alcohols. Conversion of primary alcohols to alkyl halides via concerted SN2 process occurs after the activation of the OH group. The hydroxyl group is activated, like being protonated or converted to a better leaving group, and then the nucleophile attacks from the backside as the leaving group departs. There are so many mechanisms in organic chemistry, but it's important to look for the patterns. Instead of saying, help, I'm dying, like in this example, just look for the patterns in these next few mechanisms. Now let's talk about elimination, specifically the E2 mechanism. This is a one-step concerted elimination reaction, where the base removes a proton as the leaving group departs simultaneously. It begins by a strong base abstracting a beta hydrogen. From here, the electrons from the CH bond form a new pi bond. This results in the leaving group departing simultaneously. Typically, anti-periplanar geometry is required and it's favored by strong bases and heat. 
heat. The E1 mechanism is a bit different in that it's a two-step elimination reaction through a carbocation intermediate. In the first step, the leaving group departs, forming a carbocation. Next, a base can abstract the beta hydrogen, resulting in double bond formation. Some key points are that this reaction actually competes with SN1 type reactions. And E1 mechanisms are favored by weak bases and polar protic solvents. And something to keep in mind is that you generally produce the more substituted or Zaitsev alkene. Now let's take a look at E1 reactions with carbocation rearrangement. This follows the previous E1 mechanism, but a carbocation rearranges before elimination. So for the mechanism, the first step is leaving group departure to form a carbocation. Next, a hydride or methyl shift can occur resulting in rearrangement. Then the base removes the beta hydrogen, forming our alkene. And the major product arises from the more stable carbocation. Now let's talk about E1 acid catalyzed dehydration of alcohols. This reaction is the conversion of alcohols to alkenes under acidic, heated conditions. In the first step of the mechanism, protonation of the OH group forms a better leaving group. From here, water can just leave forming a carbocation. Next, deprotonation allows us to form our alkene. Some key points are that secondary and tertiary alcohols typically proceed via the E1 mechanism. And often, a strong acid like sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid plus heat are required. We can also do E2 reactions that are acid-catalyzed dehydration of primary alcohols. Here, primary alcohols undergo concerted elimination since they can't form stable carbocations. In the first step, we first protonate the hydroxyl group to make it a better leaving group. Group. Next, a base will come and abstract the beta hydrogen and water will leave simultaneously resulting in alkene formation. Some key points are that this E2 pathway avoids unstable carbocations and it also requires strong acid and heat. Now let's talk about the opposite reaction, where we can do the hydration of alkenes via electrophilic addition. This reaction results in the addition of water across a double bond. Typically, it's acid catalyzed and results in the Markovnikov addition. In the first step, protonation of the alkene forms a carbocation. Next, water can attack, which will form an oxonium ion. Finally, we can deprotonate that oxonium ion to give the alcohol product. Remember, this reaction follows the Markovnikov rule and it's reversible with dehydration. Remember that the Markovnikov rule states that hydrogen will be added to the carbon that already has the most hydrogens. Next, let's talk about the halogenation of alkenes. In this mechanism, the pi bond attacks the halogen and this results in the formation of what's known as a halonium ion intermediate. Next, the halide that left will do a nucleophilic attack at one of the carbon positions. This will open the ring and form a vicinal dihalide. Some key points is that this always results in anti-addition, and it also occurs in generally inert solvents like tetrachloromethane. We can also do electrophilic addition of acids to alkenes. Specifically, we can do this addition with a hydrogen halide or HX to the alkene. The mechanism begins with protonation of the double bond with the acid. This is going to generate a carbocation. From here, the halide can come and attack, resulting in an alkyl halide product. And just like before, this always results in the Markovnikov addition, unless we use peroxides, and then you can form the anti-Markovnikov product. Next, let's talk about keto enol tautomerization. In this reaction, it's actually an equilibrium between the keto and enol forms via a proton transfer. In the acid catalyzed mechanism, the first step is to protonate the carbonyl oxygen. This results in enol formation via an alpha proton removal. Some key points are that the keto is usually more stable. And it's also a very important reaction in carbonyl chemistry and enolate reactions. Now these next few mechanisms are guaranteed to show up on your next exam. And I wish I was kidding, but the last time I told a joke, there was no reaction. Now let's talk a bit about radicals, specifically alkane halogenation. In this reaction, the free radical substitution of alkanes with halogens occurs, typically initiated by light or heat. And these radical reactions follow an initiation, propagation, termination pathway. In the initiation step, the halogen radicals are formed. These radicals can then propagate by abstracting a hydrogen, which is going to form an alkyl radical. And these alkyl radicals can react with another one of our dihalides. This allows more radicals to be formed until eventually they terminate in some combination of radicals. Remember, in these mechanisms, we typically draw a fish hook arrow to indicate that 
that only one electron is moving at a time. Next, let's talk a little bit about alkynes, specifically the reduction of alkynes via the sodium ammonia pathway, and it uses sodium and ammonia. In this mechanism, the first step is a single electron transfer to generate what's known as a radical anion of the previous alkyne. From here, protonation can occur, which is why we need the ammonia to generate a vinyl radical. Next, a second electron transfer occurs, resulting in a vinyl anion, which can then be protonated to eventually lead to us getting the transalkene. And that's important because this generally always produces either the trans or E alkenes, and it typically occurs under cold basic conditions. Now let's talk about the epoxidation of alkenes. In this reaction, we're doing an oxidation of an alkene to an epoxide, generally using some sort of peroxy acid, like MCPBA, or metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. This is a concerted mechanism that results in the transfer of an oxygen atom from the peroxy acid to the alkene. And this always results in what's known as syn addition and it retains the stereochemistry. Some key points are that it's stereospecific because alkene geometry is retained and typically you don't form any intermediates because it's a concerted mechanism. All right, I guess I'd make another chemistry joke, but all the good ones are gone. Get it? Are gone? Let's talk about allylic groups, specifically the allylic bromination with NBS. NBS stands for N-bromosuccinamide, and this reaction is a radical bromination that's selected for allylic or benzylic positions. The mechanism begins with radical initiation by either light or peroxides. The NBS molecule results in a bromine radical, and from here, the allylic hydrogen can be abstracted by the radical to form a brand new allylic radical. This is resonance stabilized, which is why this reaction is favored. And from here, the radical can react with NBS to form an allylic bromide. Some key points are that it always maintains the double bond that's there, and it's selective for allylic sites. Sticking in the halide family, let's talk about halohydrin formation. This reaction is an addition of halogen and water to an alkene to form what's known as a halohydrin. In the mechanism, the first step is that the alkene will react with the halide to form a halonium ion. From here, water can attack the more substituted carbon. Next, deprotonation gives us our final product known as a halohydrin. Some key points are that this always results in anti-addition and typically you get Markovnikov orientation for the hydroxyl group. Let's talk about using thionyl chloride for substitution reactions. In this reaction, we're converting an alcohol to an alkyl chloride via a substrate known as thionyl chloride, or SOCl2. In the mechanism, the first step is the formation of an alkyl chloral sulfite intermediate. This occurs when the oxygen on the hydroxyl group attacks our thionyl chloride. This kicks off a chloride, and also then allows the chloride to attack via backside displacement, giving rise to SO2 and HCl as byproducts. Some key points are that since this is an SN2 concerted mechanism, inversion of the configuration results. There are other ways to make alcohols better leaving groups. One of them is the formation of tosylates, and tosylates serve as excellent leaving groups for SN2 and E2 reactions. In the mechanism, the alcohol is first converted to a tosylate using tosyl chloride and pyridine. Tosylates can undergo sub substitution or elimination depending on whether or not you're using a base or something that's just strongly nucleophilic. And in the SN2 reaction, you get inversion of the stereochemistry, and in the E2 mechanism, you get anti-elimination. Finally, let's talk about alcohol substitution with phosphorus tribromide. In this reaction, we're converting alcohols to alkyl bromides via PBr3 through an SN2 type reaction. In the first step, the alcohol will attack the phosphorus, kicking off a bromide. This gives us a phosphorus ester intermediate. And from here, the bromide ion can come and displace the better leaving group via backside attack. This always proceeds with inversion of the stereochemical configuration, and it works really well for primary and secondary alcohols. And that's the quickest that I can possibly describe all the mechanisms for Organic Chemistry 1. I highly encourage you to use flashcards to memorize all the different types of reactions, and I also have a playlist here where you can find tons of information about organic chemistry. If you got value from this video, I'd love for you to subscribe and leave a comment down below so you can join our community. Keep practicing those mechanisms, and I'll see you in the next video.